Good morning, everyone. So we're reading in Book 2, Canto 10, The Kingdoms and Godheads of the Little Mind. We read about these three levels of mind, uh, the physical mind, hammering at fact and form, the vital mind, the, the burning spirit of desire, and last of the three, the power of reason. This as about reason, it starts on page 249. We read uh, to the end of the canto from there, and then we went back here to the middle of page 249 and started to look more closely at Sri Aurobindo's description of the reason. And we reached page 251, line 473. Her sciences, precise and absolute. So we'll move on from there. You'd like to start, Patty? Her sciences, precise and absolute, on the huge bare walls of human nations, written round nature's deep, dumb hieroglyphs. She pens in clear, demotic characters, the vast encyclopedia of her thoughts, an algebra of her mathematic signs, her numbers and unerring formulas she builds to clinch her summary of things. On all sides, runs as if in a cosmic mosque, tracing the scriptural verses of her laws, the dadle of her patterned arabesque, art of her wisdom, artifice of her law. This art, this artifice, are her only stock. Thank you. So this is reason, and it's as if um, human nescience, our not knowing, is a vast structure with huge bare walls. There on those walls, what, is, what we see is the huge dumb hieroglyphs of nature, the data, the, the impressions, the images that nature gives us. But to us, they are hieroglyphs originally, I mean to humanity. They're written in a kind of secret language. But reason takes hold of that, those uh, dumb hieroglyphs, and around them she writes in clear demotic characters. <laughs> demotic, that's the language of the people. We can all understand. So, of course, it was a great moment in uh, uh, the history of languages when they discovered in Egypt uh, something called the Rosetta Stone, on which there was a lengthy inscription in hieroglyphs, in that sacred, secret, priestly writing of the Egyptians. But then they realized the same text written in Greek demotic that anybody could understand. So, in, yes, please, Shaiv. There are three languages, three scriptures. Yes. The hieroglyph, Egyptian demotic, mm -hmm. and Greek. And the Greek. Thank you, Shaiv. Yes. So, suddenly, that opened up uh, a, a way to interpret the great dumb hieroglyphs that are <laughs> written all over the walls of uh, Egyptian temples and uh, tombs and uh, figures. Big step forward. So, the, in a way, this is what uh, reason does for us. She gives us a key to understanding nature in terms that we can grasp. So, using uh, a language that we feel we can understand and use ourselves, um, she, uh, reason, gives us the vast encyclopedia of her thoughts and the algebra of her mathematics signs. Algebra, of course, is also a, a mathematical language that if we can understand it, it's the key to understanding many aspects, not only mathematics, but the world around us. Mm. Uh, It's the secret of the Veda. We hear about Vedic mathematics, but I, I really don't know how it works. I'm also mathematically illiterate, I have to confess. So anyway, uh, 
reason interprets to us the numbers and the unerring formulas. And she uses all these, reason uses all these things to clinch, to fasten up tightly and securely her summary of things. She doesn't give us an entirely detailed um, account, but a summary of things. So for us here in the midst of nature, with the help of reason, it's as if we are in a mosque, cosmic mosque, a mosque of the whole universe. And in a mosque, uh, there will be written very, very beautifully in, um, in mosaics or painting on the walls, um, in this beautiful Arabic calligraphy, there will be messages messages from the divine. So she, oh, it's as, on all sides, runs as if in a cosmic moss, tracing the scriptural verses of her laws. That's what's usually written on the walls of a mosque, the verses from the Quran, the didal of her patterned arabesques. A didal is a border a decorative border around the top of a wall. So in the mosque, that's what we have. And it can be very, very intricate. And arabesque is a, an adjective that has been coined in European languages to speak about this beautiful kind of calligraphy and uh, curving and geometrical designs that are typical of uh, Islamic art. Mm. Yeah. This is the art of the wisdom and the artifice, uh, well, the, the artificial product of her law, of her learning. And then he says, this art and this artifice are the only stop of reason. So he will explain himself more fully in the next lines. It is a labyrinth. Um, Didylus was the engineer who created the labyrinth in Crete to imprison the Minotaur, this bull-headed monster. But um, in architecture, if I'm not wrong, it has come to mean this kind of decorated border. Am I right, Helmut? Yeah. yeah. And uh, particularly in Greek art, that, uh, that border it looks a bit like a labyrinth, and maybe in the uh, in the mosques, it's even more labyrinthine and complicated to follow. And uh, in the mosque, in the mosque, hmm. you cannot have uh, the image of human beings. You shouldn't have the the images of anything in nature, no. Yes. Uh, please, Don. Yes. Uh, cunningly skillful in artistic imagination, maze like like a maze, like a labyrinth, yeah. Yes. Yes, what does Chambers say? He says that uh, a mystical artist who constructed the Cretan labyrinth. Mythical, a mythical artist, or engineer he was really, who constructed the Cretan labyrinth, yes. But this adjective from his name, from Didylus, gets used in uh, different contexts, like... Mm. Intricate, yeah. Cunningly skillful. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah. But also decorative. But here, when he uses it, what does he? How does he uses it? As I found the cosmic moss, the deedle of her patterned arabesques. Yes, it's this decorative border around the top of the wall. Uh, Four hundred and eighty-three. Here, Sri Aurobindo is using it as a noun, yes. And it is used as a noun in this sense of a decorative board. So, who's next? Would you like to read? The art, this artifice, are her own stock. In her high work, pure intelligence, in her withdrawal from the senses trap, there comes no breaking of the walls of mind. There leaves no rending flesh of the absolute Continue, please. Hmm. There dawns no light of heavenly certitude. A million faces wears her knowledge here, and every face turned with a doubt. All now is questioned, 
Continue to this. Yes, yeah, sorry. Her old great mythic writings disappear and into their place start strict ephemeral signs. This constant change spells progress to her eyes. Her thought is an endless march without a goal. There is no summit on which she can stand and see in a single glance the infinitives, infinitives, whole. Hmm. There we'll stop. Full stop. Indentation. So this is the limitation of reason. She gives us these clear demotic characters that help us to understand <laughs> the world around us, but it is really limited. If I go back to line 486, in her high works of pure intelligence, in her withdrawal from the senses Trap. This is one of the things that reason can do. Pure reason is not forced to depend on the data we get from our senses. Pure reason can go higher than that and uh, work out all kinds of things, uh, knowledge, understanding, that isn't available directly from sense experience. Mm -hmm. But even so, there comes no breaking of the walls of mind. She works still within the limitations of the mind. Into reason, there leaps no rending flash of absolute power. Some wonderful intuitive revelation. No? There dawns no light of heavenly certitude. Her knowledge here wears a million faces. We can prove all kinds of things by reason and understand and read all different kinds of conclusion. But all of them, he says, are wearing this turban, this quest in a question, in the form of a question mark no? of doubt. Reason can't, uh, alone cannot give us absolute certitude. So all now is question, all reduced to naught, to nothingness. Once monumental in their massive craft, her old great mythic writings disappear. He spoke earlier on about the, the power of myth, how illuminating that can be to us at a certain stage of, our, of the development of our understanding. But when we rely on reason, then they disappear. And instead, uh, what we have are her strict the strict signs, the algebraic, mathematical, rational signs of reason. And this constant change, people who really believe in reason, um, they think this means progress. Yeah. But her thought is not really leading anywhere. It's an endless march without a goal. There's no summit, no high point on which reason can base herself firmly and uh, spread light all over the world and see in a single glance the whole infinite universe. Mm. You had something done? Yeah, it's a little strange. Uh, on line 696, and in their place are strict, very strict, but yet ephemeral signs. Yeah. Not steady, not stable. Mm. It means that uh, we believe in them for a time and then. We, we move on to something else. <laughs> He's being paradoxical again, yeah, using these contradictory words. Mm -hmm. So now he's going to tell us some more about reason. This is what happens with science, actually. Yeah. Once science says this, and mm -hmm. uh, 40 years or 100 years... They come to a different conclusion, yes. Exactly. Would you like to read next? Mm -hmm. Line 501. Inconclusive. This reason's toil, each strong idea can use her as its tool, accepting every grief she keeps her case. Open to every thought she cannot know, the eternal advocate seated as judge, armors and logics 
Thank you. All this hard work of the reason, reason's toil, is inconclusive. It doesn't come to a final conclusion. Every strong idea that comes up can use reason as its tool, and reason allows this. She accepts every brief. A brief is what you give to a lawyer. You go to a lawyer and you tell him, uh, look, I've got this and this problem and I want you to represent my case and it's like this, this is what I have to say. And if you pay him his fee, he will argue your brief. He will not think about uh, what is really the truth of the matter. You are his client, he will argue your case. No? He takes every case. Hmm? He takes every case. Yes, yes, right. Yes, yes. Accepting every brief. She pleads her case. She doesn't uh, discriminate between the value of them. She's open to every thought, but because of that, she can't really know. She's uh, like an eternal advocate. An advocate is that lawyer who's putting forward the brief. No? If she, the advocate is seated as the judge, no? he will uh, give this invulnerable armor in, of logic to the case. You know, nobody will be able to prove him wrong. But that uh, armor, he will lend it to a thousand different uh, warriors who are fighting for truth's veiled throne. They all uh, are arguing and saying, I should sit on the throne of truth. I should, I've got the truth. But uh, if all they've got to go on is reason and logic, um, they're all actually equally unable to prove their case. They, uh, they are like uh, combatants in one of those old tournaments, medieval tournaments, uh, riding on horseback with your lance, uh, tilting. It was called tilting because what you wanted to do was to tilt your opponent, push him off his horse, uh, to tilt forever. His lance, his weapon, his words. And this is only a mock tournament. None of those combatants can win. She's an assayer. An assayer is somebody who finds out the value of something. Mm -hmm. She's assaying thoughts, values with her rigid tests. Usually these tests are chemical tests to find out whether it's pure gold or silver or something else. No. So there she is, just like that image of truth, sitting balanced with her balance and her sword and blindfold, no. like justice. She, there she sits on a wide and empty air, aloof and pure in her impartial poise. She's not leaning to one side or the other, treating everything equally. Her judgments seem to be absolute, but none of them is sure. Time cancels all her verdicts in appeal. The judge has given a judgment. You can always appeal. And after some time, as uh, Turiya said, time cancels the verdict. New, new information comes, new uh, ways of seeing things come. So all those absolute judgments get cancelled in appeal. Yes. Can I read a quote about being reasonable by mother? Yes, please. Finally, you do not grow anymore by growing reasonable. You stop growing altogether. That's it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> because you consider your judgments are absolute. Hmm? Yeah. <clears throat> However, if your things are at an infrarational stage, then rational is better than that. Yes, right. Yes. Yeah, that, we can also quote mother on that. No? Yes. Until you have that higher kind of intuition, which is absolutely sure, please don't leave your reason. Because then you will be in danger 
of becoming one of those irrational beings of, all, of whom there are far too many already in the world. So yes, for us human beings, reason is a great light. But here he's showing us uh, how it is not a perfect light, that there's a higher light. We need that uh, fly, flash from above to give us the higher light. Mm. Everybody can justify. Yeah. All quarrels are like that. Naren, you would read? Although like sunbeams to a low-bound mind, her knowledge fails to fall from clear heaven. Its rays are lantern clusters in the night. She throws, she throws a glittering robe on ignorance. But now has lost her ancient sovereign claim to rule mind's high land in an absolute fight. Bind thought with logics or forged infallible chain, or see the truth new in a bright abstract face. A master and slave of star phenomena, she travels on roads of erring sight, or looks upon a set of mechanical world constructed for her by her instruments. A bullet broke in the cart of proven fact, she drag, drags huge knowledge wheels through metal's dust. To reach utilities, immense bazaar. Apprentice, she has grown to an old drudge, and aided sense in her seeking arbiter, seeking's arbiter. And now she uses as a assayer's stone. And this, sorry, and this now she uses as a assayer's stone, as if she knows not facts are husks of truth. The husk she keeps, the kernel throws aside. Thank you. So this is Shobindo's critique of materialist science, the, the kind of reasoning which is tied to sense data. He says it's become like that. We use the reason only in this very practical way. And because of that, um, her claim, her ancient sovereign claim to rule mind's high realm in her absolute right, she's lost that because she's not using reason in its highest way. But still, to us, with our glow-worm mind, mind that has only a very faint <laughs> light, like one of those little insects in the night, her knowledge feigns, pretends to fall from a clear heaven, from a clear sky of knowledge. In fact, the rays are like a lantern, the light of a lantern in the night. Relatively bright, but not very. So what reason is doing is on our ignorance, it's, it's covering it with a glittering robe. But we have to remember that all that glitters is not gold. No, it's not necessarily gold. It's not necessarily the light of the sun of truth. So in that way, she has lost her ancient sovereign claim to rule mind's high realm in her own absolute right, that she's the highest power. She, her claim to bind thought with logics forged infallible chain, you know, fixed chains step by step logical rule. It's a very in useful tool, but still, it doesn't show us the truth. And even if um, she uses that logic and that power of reason for abstract thought, it's still not reliable. And particularly now, reason in the modern age has become not only a master, but the slave of phenomenon, of physical facts. So reason is traveling on roads of erring sight. It gives some power of vision, but it's not reliable. She looks upon a set mechanical world constructed for her by her instruments. That's what her instruments tell her. Her instruments first of the senses and then of these tools which uh, we devise for ourselves to extend the scope of our senses. So she's no longer this high angel <laughs> seated on empty air. She's more like a bullock hmm, yoked in the cart of proven facts dragging huge knowledge bales, huge bundles of knowledge through matter's dust. And where is she going? To reach utilities, immense bazaar. 
this marketplace where the only value is usefulness. The senses used to be her drudge, her servant, well, humble servant, but now she's become an apprentice to her old drudge. An aided sense is what decides, is the arbiter of her seeking, tells her whether it's right or wrong. This, is, this sense is what she uses as the assayer's stone. It's a stone we can use to test the, um, uh, yeah, whether it's really gold or not. Mm -hmm. What? No, a saying means to establish the value of something. An assayer, he's somebody who finds out whether it's really gold or silver or not. I, maybe I said something else about the balancing. I didn't get the part about the old drudge. The old drudge is the senses, the body. So, the, 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 the physical or the physical mind or the, yeah. So reason has become an apprentice. To, the, to physical. Physical. Mm. As if she knew not. Actually, the reason does know that facts are only husks. They're only the hard shell of truth. They are not the kernel. They're not the, the really good, valuable bit that's inside. But in modern science, they keep the husks, the outside appearances, and uh, throws away kernel, the really nourishing part. <laughs> The really valuable part, which is within, covered by that husk. Which is pretty much governed by the things of the senses. Right, that's what. That's the base of science. Of, of, of what we can call materialistic science, yeah. which, as we mentioned another day, has actually become a kind of religion. It's not any longer uh, a field of open, free, uh, dispassionate inquiry. There are certain uh, dogmas that if you don't follow those, if you reach different conclusions, then you're not regarded as a real rational scientist at all. You, know, you may not be allowed to publish, you may lose your job if you're willing to look beyond the husks and find something else. Yes, Shaif. An aided sense is a seeking arbiter. Mm. So we, we don't only use our physical senses, we use our measuring rods and probes and lenses and uh, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. But whatever, so the sense is aided, but whatever we find out with these extensions of our physical senses, uh, we consider to be the arbiter, the one who decides the value of the of our of what of our research, yeah. our seeking. I mean, not we, them, we, the the modern human materialistic mind. It's already changing. Yeah. About this camera, uh, this week we have seen in Cinema Paradiso hmm? scientific movies. Yes. Yeah. And three of these were done in the Higgs boson. About the Higgs boson. Which is the smallest particle, temporary particles, which are turned down just uh, one second after the Big Boom. Mm. And they built, coheres this big accelerator. So to try and detect it. Find, uh, <laughs> and uh, that can be considered the caramel, because it's mm. the smallest temporary part of the whole uh, universe. For the time being. For the time being. <laughs> <laughs> to our current scientific understanding. And yeah. the funny thing is that we have seen for two or three evenings mm. movies about the preparation and interviews mm. to the scientists mm. about this really incredibly small thing and have spent like, you know, billions, billions. For creating this big accelerating mm. thing. And mm. again, uh, I mean, something that you cannot see, you cannot test. They just have... But for them it's the important. Small gap of possibilities. Yeah. But for them it's important because they consider this is the, the whole base of the physical world, you know, of this universe that we live in. That, that's what they call the basic building block, yes. Yeah. So there it's very interesting if you remember what we, uh, uh, we read 
uh, in the beginning of um, the kingdom of the little life uh, about these basic building blocks, things that are coming into existence just for a moment and then disappearing again. Um, they are, in a way, the base. But what's the real base is what is not what can't, is not detectable by our aided sense. That uh, when he when Aswapati tracks things really to their source, he finds there a present, a mystic present from which everything is uh, emerging, including the Higgs boson. In those films, they show uh, they done research, research, all this is physics, and, and then it, it, they, out of all of these numbers and everything, a standard model of the universe, and it sort of is on the screen for a moment, then disappears, and it's the mother symbol, there are 12 units around, then there are four categories, and in the center will be the Higgs boson. One thing that's holding all I'm holding together. everything together. How nice. <laughs> The what? They call it the God particle. I'm sorry. He said this this particle, the Higgs boson particle. They call it the God particle because it's holding everything together. But what what we should realize is that our physical instruments and our um, reason are leading us to that very borderline between the material world and the subtle world. No? And the material world uh, is just like a kind of skin <laughs> on, all the, on the outside of this immense range of uh, subtle worlds. And we might, we might remember that uh, Shobindo has said, what are these worlds? Where are they? They are in us. No? They are all within us. And that's why Aswapati is able to go within himself to start his journey of exploration through all the subtle world. And now he's in the little mind no? with reason. But what is the consequence for us? That's very interesting what he tells next. Arturia, did you read? Will you read? An ancient wisdom fades into the past. The ages faith becomes an idle thing. God passes out the wake of thought. An old discarded dream needed no more. Only she seeks mechanic natures, interpreting stone laws to inevitable. She digs into matters hard to conceal in soil to unearth processes of all things done. A loaded, huge, self-world machine appears. To her eyes, eager and admiring stare, an intricate and meaningless engineering of order to be full and unfailing chance. Ingenious and ridiculous and minute, a good and conscious accurate device, <coughs> and rolls an unerring march maps a sure road. It plans without thinking, acts without a will, a million purposes, serves with purpose none, and builds a rational world without a man. It has no mover, no maker, no idea. Its vast self-action toils a lifeless energy, irresistibly driven, death head on the body of necessity, and generally life and father's consciousness then wonders why all was and when she came. Mm. Thank you. Would you like to read? Our thoughts are part of the immense machine, of our wandering, but a free of matter's law. The mystery laws was a fancy or a blind. Our soul, our spirit, we have now no need. Matter is admirable reality. The patent, unescapable miracle, the hard root of things, simple internal soul, external internal soul, this a societal rush, expand, deter, treating the world by the mystery of the self loss, as all its scattered work later shall the self disintegrating force contract the immense expansion 
it has made, then endless mighty and unmeaning toil, the void is left bare, weakened as before. Thus, in vindicated, crowned the grand new thought, explained the world and mastered all in the, its law. Touched the dumb root, woke, weighed tremendous powers, I bound it bound to service and unconscious digins Jins. Jins. that sleep unused in matters of ignorant grace. All was precise, rigid, indubitable. Now we'll stop there. We'll stop there. All was precise, rigid, indubitable. The materialist dogma. And our thoughts are just parts of this immense machine. The fact that we think and wonder, it's just a freak of matter's law. The mystic's law, what they told us, the ancient knowers and seers, it's just a fancy or it's meant to deceive us. Now we don't need soul or spirit. We have no need. Matter is the reality, patent, inescapable miracle. Of course it is a miracle, but whether it's the soul reality is another thing. The hard truth of things, simple, eternal soul. And then he speaks about this uh, doctrine of entropy, you know, that our uh, universe has come into existence by this suicidal, rash expenditure creating the world by a mystery of self-loss, has poured its scattered works on empty space. It's a nice uh, uh, evocation of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And late, after a long time, they say, this self-disintegrating force which has spread itself out like that and which is spreading more and more and disintegrating more and more, it will uh, start to contract contract the immense expansion it has made and it will go on contracting until everything is gone to a big black hole. The, then ends the mighty and unmeaning toil. The whole thing has been absolutely meaningless. The void, the original emptiness is left bare, vacant as before. Thus vindicated, justified, crowned the grand new thought explained the world and mastered all its laws, touched the dumb roots, woke veiled tremendous powers, electricity, nuclear fusion and fission, all these tremendous powers. It bound to service the unconscious jinns, the powerful spirits which are sleeping unused in this ignorant trance of matter. So everything is worked out. All was precise, rigid, indubitable. Can't be quest questioned. There's no doubt about Dali. But when matters were as easy, there is a room stood up firm and clear cut and said, all staggered back into a sea of gold. This solid scheme melted in endless flukes. She had made the formless power in vector of form. Suddenly she stumbled upon things unseen. A lightning from the undiscovered truth toppled her eyes with its perplexing glare and dug a gulf between the real and known till all her knowledge seemed an ignorance. Once more, the world was made of wonder web, a magic process in a magical space, an unintelligible magical death, whose source is lost in the ineffable. Once more, we face the black and the mm. So let's let's stop there. Once more, we face the blank unknowable. Nothing seems sure. This is perhaps the discovery of quantum energies. Reason comes into contact with the formless power which gives rise to all forms. Reason suddenly stumbles upon things that are unseen, invisible. So that's like a flash of lightning which um, shows a gulf between the real, what seems real to us, and the knowledge which uh, has been revealed to us. 
it's very, very confusing. People are trying to make <laughs> sense of all this. But I remember my beloved teacher Amal telling me what is needed to explain these new quantum discoveries. It's not a new theory, it's a new consciousness. Because really the way they explain it is ununderstandable, unless you're tricking yourself all the time. Once more, the world, or all her knowledge, all the knowledge of wisdom, seems an ignorance, which of course it is. Once more, the world was made a wonder web, an incredible weaving together of miracles, a magic process in a magical space, an unintelligible miracle's depth whose source is lost in the ineffable, in what cannot be explained. Once more, we face the blank unknown. The mind faces. That is what uh, Professor Aurobindo Basu told us and showed us from Sri writing. The unknowable is unknowable to the mind, but it can be known if we go beyond mind. That's what he shows us for party doing in Book 3. A whole. Is the subject of this sentence, a whole meaning a complete... A complete uh, theory of everything. Like, uh, for example, when they discover that you quantum... Yes, I think that's what he's talking about. They thought they had everything worked out. And of course it happens again and again in the history of science. They think they have it all worked out and, uh, and just a couple of steps further and it will all be clear. There'll be a grand unified theory of everything. But then... Something unexpected happened. <laughs> Who said? Einstein. Who? Einstein. Einstein. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Well, he was a very, very wise man. <laughs> And of course, that's the mark of the real scientists, the really great scientists, that they say, whatever we've discovered, we're just like little children playing with pebbles on the shores of an infinite ocean. That's really the mark, not the people who say, we've got it all worked out. This is it. Right, yeah. We can read a little further. Nanoha. Once more, we face the blank unknown. We crash the body in a huge wood crack. In the sputter and scatter of her breaking world, she lost her clear and self constructed world. Quantum dance remaining, role of chance in energies to panel stripping world. Ceaseless motion in the unbounded void. Invented forms without a thought or aim. Necessity and cause were shapeless laws. Matter was an incident in being's flow, low by the clockwork habit of blind force. Ideas, ethics, systems had no base, and full collapse all without sanctioning me. All grew a chaos, a heave and flash and scrap. Ideas worrying and fears leaped upon life. The heart compression held down anarchy, and liberty was only a phantom's name. Creation and destruction walls in arms on the bosom of a torn and quaking earth, all reeled into a world, world of callous dance. Thus stumbled, sinking, sprawling in the void, clutching, clutching for props, the soil on which to stand, she only saw a thin atomic dust. The ray of force pass substratum universe on which floats a solid world phenomenal phase. Let's pause there. Oh, wait, yes, let's pause there. Mm -hmm. I think he's evoking the, the social consequences of this collapse of reason. Mm -hmm. I think she's referring to quantum theory and quantum mechanics 
Yes, but it had an effect. The fact that uh, everything that uh, we had, cons that reason had told us, is suddenly shown to be uh, shaky at the, at the least, um, was reflected. We can say it was reflected in the his in world history. Isn't that why mind and reason cling so rigidly and strongly to us? Yes, because that's the only that's the only certitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Larry. Death had on the body of necessity. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that he put death like that, and, and death plays such an important role later on, <laughs> representative of, you know, a kind of point of view when he argues with savagery, and he kind of argues some of these points of science. And yes. after all, it's nothing. You know, after all, everything comes back to me. Yes. Yes, what is this death's head? You know, it is that the world, what seems to be at work is what he said, disintegration, you know? entropy. Everything's disintegrating. And it's twinned with this principle of necessity, things mm -hmm. that have to happen that are somehow uh, predetermined or fixed and can't be changed. And it's a very interesting theme which surfaces again and again through the poem, is this uh, um, interchange, balancing, interaction of what is necessity and what is charm, what has to happen and what seems to be unpredictable and uh, yeah, unpredictable, unexpected. Yes, Paula? The dilemma I have comes with this line, ideals, ethics, systems had no base and soon collapsed or with an without sanction lived. Mm. Because it seems like in our world right now, so much of what we see and do or in, are involved in involves corruption, unethical behavior, mm. um, really dark. The dance is really quite dark. And so when one takes a step forward to say, you know, well, here's a guideline, here's an ethical stand that you could take in the face of corruption, in the face of unethical behavior, you could try this. But this is almost saying it doesn't matter. It's in a collapse. It's in a collapse state anyway. Mm -hmm. So this this ideal, these ethics are all these things on which our social yes. development over the centuries has been based. If those are no longer valid, then you get a world like the world we see around us today. So we need a whole new set of certainties <laughs> of values. Yes. Uh, and what Sri Aurobindo says, mm -hmm. this, this happening, this bankruptcy is actually a sign that uh, we have to find a new way. You know, this is the big opportunity. This is humanity at the crossroads, you know. Uh, Karen Singh spoke about that. Uh, he, he says it's even a promise, Sri Aurobindo says. It's even a promise that uh, something new not only needs to come, but uh, will surely come. Doom is the ultimate disaster. Doom. It's actually the end of the world. Doomsday. It's the, the day when the whole world collapses. The doom crack. Yeah, the doom crack. That's what it is, no? <laughs> this whole universe is just going to burst apart. And of course, in, uh, according to the traditional view, then the great judge will be there and will be deciding... Uh, who's going to move into a new world and who's going to be finished off in a very unpleasant manner. <laughs> that's, the, that's the picture of doom. Hmm? Hmm? Sorry? I think it's in um, the book of Revelation in, in the New Testament, the Day of Judgment. It's been built upon, of course, by the religious over the years, over the centuries. So what, sorry. The hmm? 